cherubim. It says that he rode on a cherub and flew, soaring on the wings of the wind. Two golden figures of cherubim sit above the Ark of the Covenant, where God promised to dwell among his people. Exodus 25, 22. I will meet you. I will meet with you there above the mercy seat, between the two cherubim that are over the ark of the testimony. I will speak with you from there about all that I have commanded you regarding the Israelites. So the cherubim were a type of angel that were very important to God. Another type of angel was the seraphim. These are only mentioned once, and they continually worship the Lord. Listen to Isaiah chapter 6, verses 2 and 3. It says that seraphim were standing above him. They each had six wings, and they covered their faces with two. They covered their feet, and with two they flew. And with one another they called, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. His glory fills the whole earth. Isn't that awesome? That these angels continually worship the Lord. Church, that's what we're to be doing. Amen. We're to be continually worship, worshiping the Lord. And of course you have some angels that are specifically mentioned. You have here Gabriel, which he is seen as a messenger. Uh, he tells of the incarnation, the birth of Jesus in the Gospels. And he also speaks to Daniel. In Daniel 8.16 and Daniel 9.21. And the other angel mentioned is Michael. Michael is a mighty warrior and protector over the nation of Israel. You'll see Michael in Jude 9, Revelation 12, 7 and 8, Daniel 10.13 and Daniel 10.21. Angels are important. They're used by God. We see here one of the most important events in history. The announcement of Christ was given by an angel. They proclaimed the birth. Thank you, son. But me and you, we are now given this charge. We are to announce the birth, the death, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ with our voice. That's what God calls me and you to do now. Share the gospel and all that big term means is the good news. Because listen, Jesus is good news. Jesus is the hope that we have in this world. But not only was the announcement of Christ given by an angel, the announcement of Christ spoke of a future kingdom. The announcement of Christ spoke of a future kingdom. Number two. Luke 1, 32 and 33 says this. He will be great and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will have no end. This scripture mentioned that Jesus will have the throne of his father David. And that's not his literal dad. We know that... that the Holy Spirit fathered him and that, that Joseph watched over him. So what does this mean, his father David? That is his ancestry from his human side. Jesus was prophesied to do this. It's spelled out for me and you in 2 Samuel 7, 12 and 13. When the time comes and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up after you your descendant who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, most of us think that the United States is old. If I'm not mistaken, it's coming up on what, 250 years? That, that's, that's a long time. China's even older than that. But listen, Christ's kingdom will reign Forever and ever and ever. Amen. Now that's good news as well. Not only are we talking about the throne of David, Gabriel says that Jesus will reign over the house of Jacob. So what does that mean? For me and you, if you study the Scriptures, the house of Jacob is a traditional term used to describe Israel. You'll see that in Exodus 19.3. 
Isaiah 2, 5 and 6, Isaiah 8, 17, and Isaiah 48, 1. The house of Jacob is described as the nation of Israel. Jesus will reign with his kingdom and over Israel forever. Listen, this is a short point, but it's got a great point. The main point me and you've got to get out of this that Gabriel's announcing is that the kingdom of Christ will never end. You know, I don't know about you, and I've said this behind the pulpit before, that eternity, I can't really imagine forever. Eternity. You know, I just said 250 years is a long time. Some of you today have a great decision to make. Because I dearly, dearly, dearly want you to be a part of this kingdom. I want you today to make up your mind and accept Christ as your King, as your Savior. And be part of this kingdom, this, this joyous house of Jacob forever. Moving on. The last thing we learn, number three, the announcement of Christ brought about obedience in Mary. The announcement of Christ brought about obedience in Mary. Look what she said. She said in verse 38, See, I am the Lord's servant. May it happen to me as you have said. Wow. Mary was obedient. She didn't argue. She didn't ask five billion questions. She's like, okay, if that's what God desires, I am the Lord's servant. We don't have time to go over all the Scripture this morning, but if you know the story, her obedience is a sharp contrast to the Scriptures right before it. If you remember, we see not the, birth of, the announcement of the birth of Jesus, but the announcement of His cousin John the Baptist. And if you remember, when the angel came to Zechariah, John the Baptist's dad, and told him about his son, do you remember Zechariah? He questioned it, right? Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, did not believe the angel, so he was unable to speak until John was born. So you see a great contrast here. It appears, according to the Scripture, that God takes great delight, not only in Mary's obedience, but in mine and your obedience. That's what God expects. He expects me and you to be obedient to His Word, to what He says. Not only did Mary say this and Mary mean this, it kind of mirrors another Old Testament person who was wanting to give birth to a son, and that's Hannah. You remember Hannah that gave birth to Samuel? Listen to what Hannah said in 1 Samuel 1.11. Making a vow, she pleaded, Lord of armies, if you will take notice of your servant's affliction, remember... And not forget me and give your servant a son. I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and his hair will never be cut. And then that's verse 11. Then 1 Samuel 1.18, Hannah says this, May your servant find favor with you. Then Hannah went on her way. She ate, she ate and no longer looked despondent. So Hannah went to the Lord and said, Lord, I'm obedient. I turn everything over to you, God, for you know what is best. If you're here this morning, most of us have probably heard the Christmas story multiple, multiple, multiple times. Maybe even multiple, multiple different ways. So sometimes, I think the question is, okay, now what? What do I do with this information, David? What, how can I apply this to my life? Well, listen, knowing the announcement of Christ was given by an angel, we must accept that our Savior's birth was miraculous and know that this Savior came to save us from our sin. That's the reason Jesus came, right? They asked Him that as an adult. He said, listen, I came to seek and save that which was lost. So let me ask you this morning, do you know this Christ? Are you lost? 
Today would be a great day to be like Mary and be obedient to God's word and accept this Christ as your Savior. I can't think of a better time. And I promise you, wholeheartedly, nobody here is going to look down on you. Nobody here is going to make fun of you. This church right here, Oak Street Baptist Church, this group of believers will rejoice to see one come forward and turn their life over to Jesus. Knowing that the announcement of Christ spoke of a future kingdom should make us want to bow our knee to Him in submission and see Him as truly the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Now listen, that's what Ephesians tells us. At one point, every single person in this room will bow their knee to Christ. We've got two options. We can either bow our knee to Christ in submission and obedience and accept Him as our Savior, or one day we will kneel before Him in judgment. So again, I plead with you, if you are here today and don't know Christ, be obedient to His Word if His Word has called out to you this morning. Number three, knowing the announcement of Christ brought about obedience in Mary should make us want to be obedient to Christ in every single aspect of our lives. Now listen, you guys know my testimony. There was a time that Pastor David wasn't following God the way he should. I was saved, but I wasn't following God. We call that rededicating. I had to rededicate my life back to God. There may be somebody here this morning who you got saved, but you know you kind of strayed a little like Brother David did. There's no shame in that. I don't want you to feel ashamed, but I want you to recognize that God calls us to be obedient and to be faithful to Him in every single aspect of our lives. As I was preparing the sermon this week, I want to say this in closing. We think of this old hymn more around Easter. But I want you to listen to the lyrics. I heard an old, old story how a Savior came from glory, how He gave His life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about His groaning of His precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. This morning, if you're here and you don't have that victory in Jesus, let today be the day that you decide to stand up and become a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ and accept that victory and be part of this kingdom, of Christ's kingdom that will reign forever and ever and ever. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we do love You. And Lord, we do thank You. Lord, if there's one person here today that doesn't know You, Father, and You've plucked at those heartstrings one more time, God, giving them one more chance, Father, let today be their day of salvation. Let Oak Street Baptist Church have a reason to rejoice, God, and to see one sinner come to You. Father, that's the reason You came and died upon the cross. So that we could be reconciled back to You through the precious blood of Jesus. For it's in the precious and holy name of Jesus we pray. Amen.